Antonia, also known as Andrew. And I have, uh, since 2009, I have been studying the Apocrypha and the Canon, which books should be scripture. And also since 2009, I have uh, come into the Hebrew roots messianic type movement where I have sought the Hebrew roots of our faith and have tried to implement the principles and teachings of the original apostles into my life. Uh, I have not, you know, perfectly been able to do that, but I, it has definitely impacted my life. I feel in a positive way. I've grown a lot over these years. I've changed my beliefs over time. As I keep studying, I learn more, and sometimes I realize I was an error on something as I come along the way, but uh, I keep growing, and I look forward to growing more and more in the scriptures and, the, and in the commandments uh, every year, so... That's me. That's great. Oh, yeah, and I want to make my own version of the Bible and uh, share it with everybody when it's done. So, Excellent. Anybody else want to? Oh, and I'm basically an esteemed convert uh, to the uh, ancient religion of the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, although it's hard to be an Essene when you don't have a group of people to be a community. So I'm trying to form a community as well someday so I can actually live out the Essene uh, path according to the Dead Sea Scrolls with an actual group of people and not just by myself because okay. by yourself you can't really have a community. Let us know when you're going to Nevada. Oh, I sold my land there uh, in 20, 2017. So, oh, um, a long time ago. So I'm going to buy a house in a few years and then I'm going to start asking a few people to live with me, pay a little bit of rent every month, and then we'll share everything. And okay. I'll, I'll see how that goes. Well, you've got to keep our email addresses and let us know. I yeah, can well. just see a community that you're the administrator of. Mm -hmm. It'd be wild. Yeah. It'd be wild, but it'd be fun. Hi, Lucas. Lucas. Move down to Oklahoma, Andrew. Unless you want to stay up there in the cold north, man. <laughs> well, well, you never know. We'll see what happens. So we've got 170 acres with nothing to do with it. <laughs> I can think of some things to do with that. Oh, I can too. I can too. It's right on a lake too, so that works. Do you want to introduce yourself while you're at it, yoking on? Oh, uh, yeah. I'm John Ritter. Um, live in Oklahoma, it's outside of Oklahoma City by Stillwater. Um, just as Andrew said, I'm actually in the process of adopting the Essene mindset and commands and applying them to my life as well, uh, and my works and my beliefs. Um, but uh, been on this, this study, well, this track, digging deeper into the, from the Dead Sea Scrolls to you know, the Clementines, um, and just really circumcising my heart and just looking forward to just learning more and more every time we meet. So. Amen. Anybody else want to try? Yeah, hello. Hello to everybody. Hi. Uh, I'm Walter. Uh, I've been studying the, the Apocrypha since like uh, 2008. And that was when I was living in South America, Colombia. Right now, I'm living in New York, Queens. And I, le I left all my physical books over there. <laughs> so I left like a kind of a little sanctuary over there. I don't know, but I felt like I had to do that. And I'm, over here, I'm, I'm collecting them uh, from scratch. Great. Uh, yeah. In and... and when I was studying all this apocrypha uh, through the internet, I found out about uh, Onir. I became friends with him. He had his, his uh, Dead Sea Scrolls group. I joined. I, I was also reading Snyder, uh, your blog. But I never got the chance like to talk to him in person. But, but I, 
I, I was like uh, joining you guys to the uh, Tony's group, Tony Burke. So, nice, uh, nice for you to be here. Yeah, so I'm joining like uh, like everybody that's that series into this, like uh, like in in that group. You know, over here, let, let let's start and let's get together and let's find the truth. Jackson, uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Who are you, Jackson? Well, you know my name. Look up the number. <laughs> no, actually, I, I've been on this since about 1989 when I went to uh, I went to Israel to a Feast of Tabernacles there, clear back at that time. And I kind of fell for the Apocrypha, especially the Dead Sea Scrolls. I got to say that I've probably forgotten more than I have learned. And that's a fact. But I just love to be part of uh, these kinds of colloquies here with different people. And we have a lot of them. So stay tuned. Uh, this, as you said, it is very difficult to to have a community as they did in the Yahad when you're so disparate. I mean, we're so uh, far apart from each other, but we're in a great new time, new age where we have broadband and as long as it lasts, let's take advantage of it. Use it for evangelism try to help other people understand and certainly enough uh, to uh, continue in communication so we can learn more from each other. Anybody else? Luke? Okay. He's got to unmute. Okay, what about now? Yeah, good. Shalom. Shalom. Hey, I'm Luke the Drifter. Uh, I try to uh, educate myself in textual criticism and biblical linguistics. Um, I'm very interested in the Essenes. A matter of fact, I consider myself a student, a student of Onya's. <laughs> He's the one who's helping me learn and to educate myself. Amen. Well, and, I, and I charge a modest fee of a hundred dollars. No, just joking. Hold on, just a second. Somebody's trying to get on here. Hundred dollars a month. No, just joking. Do you charge? No, no, I don't. Yeah, the Essene way. You've got to give everything away. Anybody else want to go before we get started? Hi, David. He's Hello, Mark. Hello. Donna and Bob. Are you ready to get started then? Yeah, let's get started. Okay, well, this is Q&A, and I don't think we've ever done this before, have we, Onya? Maybe you have, but... Uh, yeah, I've done it on my YouTube channel before a little bit. Okay. I have already some questions that people have put in here and they're actually they're quite different languages let's start off with one of those from email and then okay. we'll go on from there like an icebreaker let me find it again in the prophets there's such a thing that is called the pure tongue today People are saying that that pure tongue is Hebrew. I wonder what you think about it. That's my question. Do you think Hebrew is the pure tongue, or is he talking some about something supernatural there in the prophets? You want to go first? Or you want me to go? Yeah, first? go ahead. Anybody? Oh, is this for everybody? Yeah. Anyone I, can answer? I, I know you're going to speak up, and so am I. Well, I, I wasn't sure how you want it to be. Did you want it to be um, where it's specifically asking the questions are asked to me and you specifically, or 
or do you want it to be set up where everybody who's at the meeting can answer the question? Yeah, let's start out with, with you and me, and then if we have an answer, if we don't, everybody can chip in. Okay, and sure people can always share what their thoughts are in the, in the group chat. Right. Um, so um, I think the passage from the prophets might be, they're talking about Zephaniah. Yes. Uh, the, pure, the pure language. Um, so the thing to keep in mind, for, so here's what I've learned in the past few years. Um, so I do believe Hebrew is the original language of creation, but what is Hebrew? So you know the, the language of English. Um, so English has changed over time. You have modern English, which we're all familiar with. Um, and then you go back farther. You have the King James, and you try to read the King James, and you say, oh, man, this is hard to read. Some of these words are, are confusing. Um, and, uh, the, you know, there's the these and the thous. What's going on? And, uh, but that's not relatively old English. That's pretty much modern English still. If you go back a couple hundred years before that, so King James Version is like the 1600s. So you go back a couple hundred years to the 1400s. Oh. 1300s, you got Middle English, which now most people who know modern English have a very hard time understanding Middle English because it uses very different spelling. But it's still pretty close to English. So if you are pretty well learned in English, you probably can for the most part, understand Middle English. It just takes a while to uh, figure it out. But if you go back a few hundred years before that, you get to what's called Old English. And now you have basically a completely different language because it's the same, it's the same language, but it is so different in spelling, um, words used, and grammar is completely different as well. Uh, a lot of different grammar stuff. So that is in only in a period of, in a period of a mere 600 years, it switched from Old English to Modern English, 600 year time frame. If uh, Hebrew, let's just say, so we, let's say Abraham or Moses knew Hebrew, right? Well, how long ago was that? That is close to, it's somewhere between 3,000 and 4,000 years um, old language. So do you really think that in that time frame the language is not going to change and radically? The fact is, the evidence I've seen is that the Hebrew language has radically changed from what it was originally. So the biblical not just, we, we know modern Hebrew is different from biblical Hebrew. But what a lot of people might not be comfortable admitting is that biblical Hebrew and even paleo Hebrew is far removed from original Hebrew. So um, when it talks about the pure language, how, you know, I don't think... Biblical Hebrew is the pure language because um, Biblical Hebrew is very corrupted in the actual uh, language. There's so many changes from the original Hebrew. Um, there's a, a whole bunch of scholarly, scholarly information about this where um, linguistic uh, scholars try to figure out the origin of languages and um, what's called the Semitic languages, all the Semitic languages originate from a proto-Semitic language, which is the original language that's the source of all Semitic languages. So Semitic would be Arabic, Aramaic, the Ethiopian language known as Ge'ez, Hebrew, um, and it also includes Akkadian. So the proto-Semitic would be the original Hebrew. So I would call proto-Semitic uh, Proto-Hebrew or original Hebrew, and then from that time on, all Semitic languages, including Hebrew, are corrupted from the original. They're not pure. So 
Uh, the pure language, if it is an actual language, um, it may be the original Hebrew. If it's not, then it just might mean um, purifying their their uh, mouths because uh, James talks about how people defile themselves with their tongue so, by what they say. Uh, they speak cursing and blessing. How can someone who's righteous speak both blessing and cursing James talks about? So I think in that, I think when you look at the context, it's talking about people becoming righteous again. And I think that's focusing more on the words we use, uh, being holy in our speech, and uh, not so much on the correct pronunciation, the, the uh, Hebrew language, because like I said, if you want to go to the truth, uh, the truth is that the original Hebrew is way different than biblical Hebrew. The pronunciation, you'll, you'll never be able to come to the original pronunciation of Hebrew if you are going with Biblical Hebrew or Paleo Hebrew. That's my uh, thought on it. Great. You know, uh, languages get simpler as time goes on. You would think that they would get more difficult, but they get simpler. That's a linguistic fact. I took a course in Chaucer English. That would be Middle English years ago in college. And I could not read that. I mean, I could read some of the words of it, but that, that's pre previous to Elizabethan English that we see in the King James. <clears throat> so it was a very difficult time in that class. It was like uh, a complete, completely different language. As far as Hebrew goes, I always considered the pure tongue well, I think the prophet says that he'll return a pure tongue. I thought that's got to be some kind of language beyond human language. Like, uh, well, it's, Paul talks about the language of angels, for instance. How could Elohim use a human language to communicate with angels and with Enoch and with everybody else? Although the scripture does say that there was a time when there was just one language and that language was corrupted. So I, I think what happens at Pentecost is that the corruption of the language comes back together when, when everybody can hear the angelic message of heaven in their own language. So I really don't know, except to say that I, I agree with uh, Onia when it comes to the disparate nature of languages at that time. So when we get to biblical Hebrew, we are far and away advanced from the whatever the pure language must have been. A perfect example of this is the way that people pronounce the sacred name today. You have Yahuwah, Yahu, Yahuwah, Yahweh, Yahuwah, uh, um, several others too, most of which are really, come, they come out of uh, more modern Hebrew. We understand that as the Hebrew got simpler and simpler, somewhere around the time of Yahshua, the U or the Vav, in the name Yahuwah, Yahuwah fell out. And in the vernacular of the first century AD, when Messiah was alive, that had fallen out and the name was pronounced Yahweh. Uh, later on, we get other uh, derivations, like a, a, a more modern one that I believe is based on, on modern Hebrew is Yahuwah. And so that wouldn't be anywhere near as old, but they're all right in a sense that the language gets simpler and simpler as time goes on. <laughs> you would think though, that we would get more understanding and more in consensus as time goes on, but it always seems like everybody's looking for their own gimmick. I think- 
he puts the uh, when he puts the the new language back in our mouths, which I hope happens too. It may be something quite different than we're expecting. Go ahead. Uh, um, just a question. Could you explain uh, by what you mean by simpler in the language? It gets less complicated. As, uh, an, as an example, all uh, older languages usually have a a case system called a declension, uh, which tells you what the subject is, what the object is, and w whether um, uh, whether something's an object in in a sentence. So if you were to say, you know, if you were to say, the king, the king. Uh, spoke to his servant um all right let's say let's do a different one uh the man read a book the man read a book in the older version of that language instead of saying um uh man and book you'd say man something to tell you it's a subject so you'd say the man subject read the book object. And that's pretty much what you see in every language uh, in the farther back you go. But in when you go into more, when time goes on, people get rid of those because they say, oh, we don't need those. Um, people know what we're talking about. Uh, it's kind of like, have you ever texted someone and say, yeah. yeah. Um, for, so for example, you, typically, you're supposed to say, I love you. If you're trying to say the sentence, I love you, you have to spell out the words. But if you're texting someone or talking to someone that you know very well, you might say, love you, love you, or see you later. Um, you are actually removing words that used to be spoke in language, but you're removing it because you don't really need to say it. It's understood. They'll know what you're talking about. Uh, so you don't need to say, I love you, because by context, it's obvious you're the one meaning it. So people tend to simplify things that are uh, super, super or, excuse me, my tongue hurts. Um, but uh, people tend to remove the more complicated language that's not always necessary for communication. It's almost going back to pictographs now. If you want to say, I love you, you send a picture of a heart <laughs> or you send some kind of Iditarod along to express how you feel. I wonder where this is going in the future. Well, another example is gender. It, older languages tend to have complicated gender, um, like regular objects, like a book. A book has a gender. A table has a gender, masculine or feminine. Sometimes it could be neuter. Um, but modern English, as well as many other modern languages, say, oh, well, we don't really need gender. It's, it's not that important. So let's just get rid of gender. And that's what has happened over time. Um, so that's what he means by it becoming simpler. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Um, there is one thing I wanted to say more about the interpretation of the verse. Um, what is interesting is in the very verse prior to the verse which says, I will restore a pure tongue. It's the only verse in the Hebrew Bible, the verse before, which includes every single letter of the Hebrew alphabet, including the five final forms. There's five final forms in the Hebrew alphabet. And the only verse in the entire Hebrew Bible that has all the le 22 letters in all the five final forms endings is in that one verse right before the verse that says he'll restore pure language. So it is a funny coincidence, um, which, and it may not be a coincidence. It may be, it may be Zephaniah did that intentionally to uh, convey a play on words. Um, someone's trying to come in, Jackson, uh, Eliyahu. He's in. Oh, okay. All right. So, uh, yeah, that's my, that's my, um, what I had to say about that topic. Want to move to another question? Sure. Who has one? If not, I'll have to supply one. 
Well, I thought you said a lot of people uh, sent stuff in. Yes, I, the, I have uh, received lots of questions. That was one of them, but not necessarily for this particular one, but I'll give oh. you a question right now. And it's the one that so many um, want to know, people that really don't know the scriptures, but they want to know this. And that is, who was Cain's wife? Oh, who was Cain's wife? Who was Cain's wife? Where did Cain get a wife? Um, well, as a Dead Sea School believer, I put a lot of stock into the Book of Jubilees. So I pretty much follow what the Ju Book of Jubilees says. Jubilees tells us that um, Adam and Eve had more than two children and that um, in addition to Cain and Abel and Seth, they also had two daughters around the same time. Um, they had Awan and Azura and Cain married his sister, Awan. And so people will say, well, they couldn't marry your, your siblings. Um, that would be wrong. But you have to think about it. The first two, no matter what you believe, be it evolution or creation, strict, strict creationism, the fact is, at some point, there had to be only siblings. That's the only way it could have happened. So... Um, by necessity, siblings had to mate with each other. Um, even if evolution is true, that requires uh, siblings to mate with each other when you go back to the beginning. All so, right. What, you know, what about uh, pre-Adamic race? Because I see two different creations in Genesis. One in Genesis 1, one in Genesis 2. If they're two different creations at two different times, then there were lots of people out there. In the first creation, people were manufactured or made. In the second creation, they were formed, Adam and Eve. So if uh, Cain built up a city, where is he going to get those people except all his own kin? So I kind of think the Torah goes back to that time even, and that he got his wife from the, the uh, first creation who were all around him. That Adam and Eve was a special thing, put in a special garden, and uh, it was guarded by angels, seraphs with uh, fire swords. So what what else would that, those angels be guarding from? Unless it was from the general pagan populace that was all around. So isn't it don't we date back to about 4,000 B.C. when we come upon Adam and Eve? Certainly there were other people on this earth in 4,000 B.C. And so he goes and finds himself a wife from among those people in the city. He builds a city himself. Anybody else on that subject? Who's buried in Grant's tomb? Oh, that's a little too simple. We have one coming in here. Um, can I add something? Sure. Let me turn this down. Uh, I also read the um, interpretation that Genesis 1 was speaking about the spirit man that was created. Then in Genesis 2, you have the physical flesh that was made. I'm not saying that's correct. That was just another theory that I read. I hadn't heard that one before. That's worth considering. A lot of people don't believe in the pre-Adamic race, but I don't see how how uh, things could run even today if that was in the case. Excuse me, uh, Snyder, do you have like a source about what you're talking about? Oh yeah, I do. If you're interested in I'll shoot it over to you if you want to put your email. Yeah, because... Here. I, I was I was studying a uh, midrash, and there's a story that there was like kind of an ape race, like they were humanoids, but they ah. were like apes, and and they went wrong. So that's that's when God created Adam and Eve, and that these kind of ape humanoids they all died in the flood. 
So it's interesting what you're saying. Yeah, definitely. Uh, in fact, some people have mapped it back in such a way that they come up with Neanderthal and yeah. the other man-like creatures. Today, they're finding out that Neanderthals weren't so dumb after all. Mm. Uh, so cavemanish uh, like we have today. And, and that um, uh, Asian people, they have like 2.9% of their dental uh, DNA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Same with us here in the United States, 2% 2, 2 or less. Yeah, so, so they're humans, they, they, they copulated with the Homo sapiens. They found a they found the grave of a child that was half human and half Neanderthal. Mm. So they had to change their idea about whether they could procreate or not. And this wasn't a hoax or a conspiracy or anything. This was an actual archaeological find. And it really had to change some of the minds of scientists who said, well, it was a completely different species. And they couldn't make. And and in uh, Raphael Petai's and Robert Graves' book, uh, he, Hebrew myths, is all related uh, about Midrash. They talk about that uh, th there's uh, Jewish legends that God created uh, different worlds be before this world, before Adam and Eve's world. Well, it's all speculation in Midrash, of course, yeah. is stories, but. It, it gets you thinking hmm. about what your origins are. And really, we have very little more in the historical record than, oh, the past 4,000 years. Hmm. Um, so I, I do want to say, um, so there's two ways. Or Okay, so there's what the Bible says. There's what scientists say. And then we have to figure out for ourselves what we believe about different things. So I would say there are a lot of things that scientists say that do not agree with what the Bible says. That doesn't mean the scientists are wrong necessarily. Um, but I think it's important that we don't, we don't say that the Bible, we don't force the Bible to say something that the authors we're not, we're not trying to say. So I think, like you said, for example, Jackson, that um, you don't see how the pre-Adamic theory could not be true due to science, um, which even if that's the case, um, I don't think that this, that means that that interpretation of Genesis is, is accurate because um, it depends what your view of the Torah is. And I actually do not have a view that's common to a lot of people about the, the Torah. My views on the Torah have, have changed over time. So basically, uh, a lot of people believe the five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, were written by Moses and are the divine word of God, the perfect word of God. I used to believe that. I no longer believe that. So basically... Um, those five books were written by some unknown author. Uh, I believe it may have been written by Solomon or Solomon's scribes that he commissioned for a project to, to um, make special compilations. Just like, you know, you have the book of Chronicles, which you read through the Chronicles and it says, for more information, go to this account. And then yeah. it tells you so-and-so prophet wrote an account of this king and da 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 da, -da. So, um, I think there were earlier accounts. Solomon took earlier accounts and created uh, the five books. And so uh, that would mean that Solomon's people or Solomon himself, his own interpretation went into uh, writing the Torah. So some things may have been simply inaccurate based on his understanding. So um, if the pre-Adamic theory is true, uh, scientifically, that does not mean Solomon or whoever wrote the Torah was trying to teach the pre-Adamic theory in the Torah. True. Um, another thing is, I place a much higher authority on Jubilees in the book of Genesis. 
I know most people place Genesis as like um, higher on the totem pole than than most of the books of Scripture. But for me, Genesis has some issues, and uh, Jubilees is more reliable and trustworthy to me. So when I read in Jubilees what it says about Cain's sister, I take that um, I take that as the basis, the foundation. And then what Genesis says, I take as secondary. So if Genesis is talking about apparently two different creations, I in Jubilees there's only one creation. Uh, so I go with Jubilees. And then also there's so many scribal changes. Like they scribes rearrange passages. They change words to add their interpretation. So while it may appear that there's two different creation accounts in Genesis, I believe rather than two creation accounts, I think it's the, just the scribes uh, changing things and the way they edited the Torah, they edited it in a confusing way. Uh, we the scholars say that the Torah was edited by five different editors. I don't fully agree with that view. But, uh, hypothesis. Yeah, documentary hypothesis. But I do believe it was edited by different groups. And uh, and so we can't place too much emphasis on, oh, it appears to be two different accounts and they can't be, they can't contradict each other. Therefore, there must be two different accounts. Um, uh, an, an example to tell you guys is um, in the, you take the Gospels, um, when you try... People have tried to take the three Gospels, the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, take these identical stories and line them up into a forming a chronology. The problem is the Gospels disagree on the chronology sometimes of the passages. So people, they'll look at the different passages and they'll see some contradictions. And, and instead of saying, okay, the passages contradict each other, instead they say, well, this event must have happened two different times. So they actually inflate the story and create a bunch of multiple, multiple events that didn't exist. Um, so I think something could be said similarly for the two creations. I think there really is only one creation and that just because there might be contradictions between the two accounts doesn't mean that it's intended to be two different accounts. It may be the same account, but simply a contradict contradicting itself in certain details. Well, yeah, they're like different sources. And there's also, there's a new theory came along in the last 50 years that's really quite uh, believable. And that is that most of Genesis was put together on cuneiform plates. Because <clears throat> when you take the way the book is composed, there's a paragraph. And at the end of the paragraph, there's a statement statement that tells you generally what was in the last paragraph and there's one after the other after the other and they're spaced in such a way that they would fit very handily on cuneiform tablets now on cuneiform tablets at the bottom there's always an index line the last line is always an index line genesis when they there's a summary at the end of each section that would serve as an index line. That, uh, that came along through Ray Capt, if you've ever heard of him, and he's dead now, but Capt wrote books, a series of books called Biblical Antiquities that have a lot of really plausible theories in that way as well. We've got another question here. Is there any more on that one? Um, Eliyahu was just asking further about uh, other points of Jubilees being before Genesis. Go ahead. Um, basically, according to Book of Jubilees, Jubilees claims to be revealed to Moses on uh, Mount Sinai during the 40 days when he went up to get the law and come back down with the law. Remember, he came down with the law and then he saw them sitting and threw the tablets that was during the 40 days when he was given the Book of Jubilees during those 40 days, uh, according to the Book of Jubilees. And so, um, evidently, that would necessitate that it comes before Genesis. Um, but there are aspects of the Book of Genesis which are 
apparently later, um, like for example, let me uh, look up one verse for you guys from Book of Genesis. Um, I it's it's something which pretty much definitely has to be from later scribes. So. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so it's uh, Genesis thirteen seven. It says, "And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. The Canaanites and the Perizzites then dwelt in the land." Uh, so basically, it's saying that. Um, it, it's giving like a clarification, like. Whoever was writing Genesis is telling the reader, oh, by the way, this happened. This happened when um, this happened when the Canaanites were still there. That implies that the Canaanites were no longer there because otherwise they wouldn't say, oh, this happened when the Canaanites were still there. Uh, all right. I'm going to disagree with you on this one because clearly in the Deuteronomy 31, it says that Moses wrote the law. How can I, he write when he's dead? Huh? And, how and the scroll was put in the Ark of the Covenant or next to the Ark of the Covenant. That's in Deuteronomy 31. Yes, so I agree with that. So, what is so the, this thing about scribes doing this and this is totally wrong. And I think that's almost on the verge of being heretical, especially putting the Book of Jubilees over Genesis. Well, talking, we're, we're not talking? concerned about heresy now. I mean, this well, is no, no, I'm I'm talking. pointing out I'm pointing out heresy because I think this is clearly heresy from the standpoint that you're putting the Book of Jubilees over Genesis. It's not heresy; it's fact. No, Wait, it's not hold, fact. Hold on, let let him talk. Uh, is this Mark? This is Mark, and I've got a problem with the Book of Jubilees is because it is not in the Bible. On only one spot is it in there, and that is in the Ethiopian canon. Do you know right? why it's not in the Bible? I think it's got some. I think it's got some problems with it, and that's the reason I'm th I'm saying that you're putting the Book of Jubilees over Genesis, and that is in the Bible and is accepted and has been accepted for years. That's the problem. Uh, I'd be. I'll be the devil's advocate here a little bit. If but the book of Jubilees is not numbering the Jubilees correctly. And that's the problem I have with it. It has brought in mm -hmm. false doctrine. Okay. So that was one of my questions from the beginning of this, of this thing. Is the book of Jubilees has false doctrine. In it, and that's the problem with the book of Jubilees. You're setting yourself up here. No, I'm not. I have read yeah. the Bible. I have read the Book of Jubilees, and this is a, I'm having an argument because you're saying something other than what's in the Genesis account. Why would and you I say that the Book of Jubilees point. is wrong? I mean, what's because it's not in the Bible, it's wrong? No, I'm saying that the Book of Jubilees cannot be used to override what's in the other portion of the books, and that's what you're doing. And that is right. a false that has down for years. You believe it's older than Genesis. No, it's not. So okay, so let's stop there for a second, because a lot a lot of things were said. So first uh -huh. of all, you you said that Moses wrote the Torah. Yeah, I agree. In the, I, of, in the book of Deuteronomy, it says that specifically, 31. I agree with that. Now Look at the part where it says that the law was put into the ark. What 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 verse do you know what verse says that the law was put into the ark? I don't remember. I'd have to look it up. Okay, I think it's I don't remember the exact verse myself, but it's like around chapter thirty one or thirty two or something. It's thirty one, chapter thirty one for sure. I just have to look it up. So now there's thirty four chapters of Deuteronomy. So if at that point chapter 31 or 32 it's the law has already been placed into the ark then how did chapters 32 yeah. to 34 get included yeah. if it's already it in the ark revelation from god 
The Revelation they, book of Revelation has stuff from the very beginning and has stuff at the very end. Hey, there's no use. Oh, yeah. that. Oh, no. Can I speak here? Sure. Snyder? Okay. The thing is that uh, the book of Jubilees, it was discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So we're talking about that the book of Jubilees is it was the 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 oldest manuscripts we have it's 2000 years ago that that means 300 years before christ that's one thing so the book of jubilees is very old and according to scholars the pentateuch it has many hands it has doublets mm -hmm. doublets is they grab one story over here and they grab the same story over there and they unify it and they put it in the pentateuch that's why we have doublets to different kinds of creations in genesis so there's many fact factors that we have to take into account uh, that will be uh editing style that will be a form of narration and all of that is studied in, in philology and paleography yes and according to scholars moses wasn't the author of the Pentateuch. It was schools of Moses. That's why we have the Deuteronomistic the group, the priestly group. Then the how do you get, group. sorry, I'm going to jump in. How do you get rid of Deuteronomy 31? So uh, let, what, me what, what, let me tell part, you my yeah. take on this. Let me tell you my take on Probably how I... Not the answer to this. How I, this is my personal belief based on how, how I believe the Torah came into origin. So... You have, um, so you had people like uh, Noah and Abraham, right? Um, I believe they wrote their own accounts. There are books claiming to be their accounts, like the Genesis Apocryphon, claims to be from Noah and Abraham. Um, Jubilees also claims that they wrote their own accounts. So you have these accounts of the patriarchs, and then you have Moses coming along, and um, Moses went on to Mount Sinai for 40 days. He went up there and he was given the first book of the law, which would be equivalent to something like um, the second half of Exodus and the book of Leviticus. So he came down uh, with the law of Exodus Leviticus. He came down, he, he wrote that. Then, um, they wandered in the wilderness for uh, 40 years. At the end of the 40 years, he went on another mountain, a final time before he died, and he gave them a, another law revealed by God to him. And this is basically identical with Deuteronomy. Uh, so Deuteronomy was given to Moses, the law portion. So he took the two, he wrote the two laws that were revealed to him the two books of the law. And then he also wrote a final testament. You know, you know how there's an apocryphal book called the Testament of Moses. I, well, most of that book is missing. It's lost. I believe originally the testament was very long and Moses wrote about his life in great detail where he basically explained, excuse me, <clears throat> he explained, this is what happened during the Exodus. This is what happened in my life. I, I, uh, I killed an Egyptian, I ran away, I uh, married Zipporah, and uh, I saw God on the mountain, the burning bush. He, all those details he wrote in his testament, but in a first-person account, like, I did this. Da, 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 da. Then, uh, w right before he died, he put the two books of law in the Ark of the Covenant, and then he gave his, t his testament to his, the priests. 500 years later, I believe Solomon then uh, took the two books of Moses' law, he took Moses' testament, and he took uh, books of the patriarchs as well as um, jubilees. He used all those sources and said, okay, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take the divinely inspired word of God and I'm gonna create a, basically a history book to help people um, know the general history of, of from beginning of creation to uh, the time of Moses and to also give people the basic content of the law. So I believe that he took it all together, put it into a neat package of five books, and from then on, people have 
read the five books as the Torah, the instruction. But I believe. So where do you get this basis from Solomon doing that? Um, so due to my study over time, I have concluded that Moses did not write the five books in totality, but he wrote some parts of the Torah. Like he wrote most of Exodus and Leviticus, um, Deuteronomy pretty much. And like I said, I, um, I also believe that he wrote um, most of uh, the information like from his point of view. So um, if he didn't write the full account of five books, my thought was who could be the author for this? And um, the only one I can see who would be capable of bringing together these disparate accounts would be Solomon because you have like the books of Chronicles, which actually tell you in the books of Chronicles that these records are derived from prior records. And it appears to me that the Chronicles and Kings were officially sanctioned accounts by royal scribes or priestly scribes of the kings because those books were specifically telling you what happened in each king's reign. That sounds like it was a king who wanted people to write about it. Uh, like kings would want people to know what's happening to the kings. So I think that the... Uh, I think Solomon would have started that tradition of recording the history of each king. Um, that is my theory. Uh, you could call it speculation. So I don't have 100% proof that Solomon is the author of the five books. But I think if it's true that Moses didn't write Genesis, for example, book of Genesis, if Moses didn't write it, who did? And I believe Solomon writing Genesis would allow it to still be a, a you know, the, Solomon was given wisdom from God. So I think if Solomon wrote Genesis, then it would be full of wisdom um, in a similar way to, to his other writings. Um, no, so what I, is you, I, you have proven that Deuteronomy is like a second book of the law and uh, some, something of a deconstruction of the temple scroll. So that, That's impressive to me. So what Jackson's talking about is I um, have come to the conclusion based on my study, my comparison of the Dead Sea Scrolls, that the temple scroll is an older version of the book of Deuteronomy. So what, let's take Mark, let's take what you said. Let's say Jubilees is not more authoritative than Genesis. Let's say Genesis is more authoritative. Let's go with that as a, for sake of discussion. The issue, however, is we don't have one Genesis text. We have multiple texts claiming to be the Genesis book of Genesis. We have the Masoretic version. We have the Samaritan version, we have the Septuagint, and then we have Dead Sea Scrolls. And they all differ for Genesis. They have variants. And some people tried to dismiss the importance of these variants and say, well, they basically say the same thing. But I would actually urge people to look at the differences because some of the differences are major and they definitely change things, potentially can change doctrines depending how much you know, some people can take one little word and letter and make a whole doctrine out of it. So if, if a lot of words and letters are different in Genesis, that could change your beliefs in a big way. So forget Jubilees. Pretend Jubilees is a fake book. Let's just go with Genesis and say which version of Genesis is the correct version. If the fact is some of them cannot be they, since they differ from each other, they can't all be correct. Let's just say that the Masoretic version is correct. Well, that means the Septuagint version, which was used by most Christians uh, in the early church, as well as like half of Christians for the last 2,000 years, well, um, that would mean that those people had a false, inaccurate version of Genesis that had errors. Same thing with the Samaritan version. People say the Samaritan version is heretical and um, has falsehoods in it. So, but the Samaritans have had that version for 2,000 years. So it, 
So if they can have a false version of Genesis, then that also leaves open the possibility that maybe the Jews also, the Masoretic scribes, their version has some errors, some falsehoods. So when I say I put Jubilees on a higher level, I am only saying that I believe the version of Jubilees we have has been preserved more accurately, has less errors in the version we have than the versions we have of Genesis. Because um, Jubilees and Genesis are so close, Jubilees almost is a version of the book of Genesis. You could almost consider it a version, its own version of book of Genesis. So you could, you could look at the, where Jubilees differs from Genesis and that Jubilees kind of is its own uh, version of Genesis. So um, which version of Genesis is correct? Uh, you have to look into it, do your study and research. Um, from what I see, the scribes tampered more with Genesis because it was more popular. And typically, when something is more popular, more people, it's going to go through more hands. More people are going to be interested in interpreting it and putting their spin on it. Jubilees was not widely used. And so it would be going through less hands, which means there's less opportunity for it to be changed by later scribes. And we do know that scripture can be changed because there's warnings which say, do not add or take away from the Torah, which means someone could actually do that. And they may have done it already. Revelation speaks of do not add or take away. It, it, it is possible to corrupt scripture. Um, since it's possible scripture can be corrupted, how can we say that scripture hasn't already been corrupted? Um, so it is these things that we need to consider. Um, I'm not telling people to disregard uh, Genesis. I believe in doing study and research and, and I believe in looking at the manuscripts and looking at the variants. So Mark, uh, could you share your perspective on the variants of Genesis in particular? Uh, the biggest variance that I have with the Book of Jubilees is the counting of the Jubilees. Uh, so it does my, not count the 50th year. I, I will uh, answer that in a second, but could you share um, what's your take on the different manuscripts of Genesis specifically, uh, which would be the Masoretic, Samaritan, and Septuagint. Do you have any opinion I, I, on I, that? I don't have any opinion on that. Have you not the, studied it? I have, I'm reading the Septuagint right now. I have a new English Septuagint, the Lexham um, English Septuagint that just came out in uh, December. So what, I'm reading what, it which, now. Which version is it? What's it called? It's called the Lexham English Septuagint. Lexham English Septuagint. It's a brand new English version because all the other ones were done. Either How familiar in, with it? It's the same old Masoretic text. No, he says it's Septuagint. It's the Septuagint. Septuagint. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, have to, I'll have to look into that. Um, so, no, the Septuagint and the Masoretic um, are not that close. They, um, some books they're pretty close, but for Can you see it. Oh, you're trying to share? Hold on. Uh, let me see. It's in the I'm... video from me. Yeah. Okay. I see. Yeah, yes, that's a new one. Um, I'll have to look into that. Yeah, I was not familiar with that one. Um, that's a new one. But oh. Melissa was saying she thought Septuagint and Masoretic were about the same. I did a version years ago for myself mainly looking at all the differences between the Septuagint and Masoretic. And I can tell you for a fact, they are definitely not the same. They radically differ in many books. Um, some books, they don't radically differ. Some, they're pretty close. Uh, but other books, they are widely different. Um, I can tell you the books they're widely different would be Genesis, Exodus are widely different in the Septuagint. Um, First and Second Samuel, widely different. Uh, First and Second Kings, widely different. Proverbs, widely different. Um, 
Jeremiah is widely different. Job, Book of Job is widely different. Um, I'd go with the Septuagint. Uh, well, I think it's. I think, text. So that's what I would say. I said years ago where I was just like Septuagint always. But over time, I have come to see that many times Masoretic is correct in places Septuagint is not. So I think I think it's a case by case basis. I would say more so than that. I still side with the Septuagint, but I have a greater appreciation for the Masoretic than I did years ago. I think it's still an important witness um, to consider. Uh, but I I urge you, Mark, and everyone else to do your own study. Um, of comparing the Septuagint and Masoretic in the different books of the Bible. And you will come to the conclusion, after seeing all the differences, that, wow, the scripture has been radically changed. Either Masoretic was changed, or Septuagint was changed, or both was changed. And when people start studying these things, sometimes their faith can get um, thrown into question. A lot of people... Uh, start to lose their faith because, well, the scriptures are not reliable, so therefore I can't have faith anymore. But the thing you have to keep in mind is um, before the Bible was written, you know, Adam was alive, right? He had faith before the Bible was written. Abraham had faith before the Bible was written. Moses, before the Bible was written. You can have faith without the Bible. So you can't, you can't uh, base your beliefs entirely on scripture if if tomorrow someone could show you that all of scripture was written by man and 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 uh is not divinely inspired they probably can't show you that but let's just say someone was able to prove it um that uh would not that should not make you an atheist that should not make you um abandon the messiah the Messiah is not contingent on everything in the Bible being true. Some things in the Bible can be false, and the Messiah is still our Savior, and the basic truths of Scripture can still be true. So you don't have to go in with it where everything has to be true or else it's all false. Um, I think that's a dangerous uh, perspective to have, and, yeah. and it can actually drive a lot of people away because once people— once it starts being exposed to criticism of atheists um, and just people of other religions and scholars outside of the Bible, if people convince you that a small part of the Bible is in error, then you decide you throw the whole Bible out. Well, that's not the, the right approach, I think. So, um, But when you see that there are so many corruptions in Scripture, like I have seen, that should inspire you to want to know the tr the what the true original of scriptures is rather than driving you away it leads me to look deeper into scripture and say wow i want to know more um, mm -hmm. i want to know more of the truth of god not less so um so that's what i would say in regards to genesis um uh and and why I think Jubilees could be more reliable than Genesis if Genesis is corrupted. Um, but Jubilees is also corrupted in, in some things is too. Jubilees is not a perfect book. There's, there's manuscripts of Jubilees and all the manuscripts have errors and falsehoods in it. Most books of scripture, I believe, have errors and falsehoods. Jubilees is no exception to this. Some of the errors we can prove Jubilees has errors would be some of the dates of when Jubilee says things are false. Um, it doesn't add up. There's in, incorrect numbers. But incorrect numbers happen in the Old Testament too. There's actually proof of false numbers in the Old Testament in certain passages, which we can talk about in another video uh, if people want to know more. Because there's plenty of uh, falsehoods in numerical data. So... Um, but now when it comes specifically to the, the year of Jubilee, you say, wait, I want to stop you for a second. Jackson, did you have another um, thing you were supposed to do after this uh, for 10 o'clock? Uh, we're we going to go on till 1030 on this. And we'll do it every week if people like it. Okay. I just want to make sure. Yeah. 
Um, so, uh, Jubilees, um, there's two interpretations here, and I would assume you're going with the, the other interpretation. And that is, a Jubilee is fi every, fi every 50 years. Is that correct, Mark? Your view, every 50 years? Is every 50 years, correct. As stated in Leviticus 25. 49. So, when you go to what Leviticus says, Leviticus tells you that there's seven Sabbath years. Every, every seven years is a unit, and the seventh year of every seven is a Sabbath year to be holy. Um, evidently, this is parallel to the, the creation week of seven days, and the seventh day is a Sabbath, a Sabbath day. You don't have to go any further than that. I would totally agree with you on that. Okay, so, so you have... So here's my point of view real quick. The numbering system that you have 50 days to the Feast of Weeks or Shavuot, which is where we get the word weeks from, all right, is the same numbering system that you use in Jubilees. It's 8 and 50. The problem is if you don't, if you go to the 49, you're counting, you're not counting the 50th year because you're making the first year of the next 49 next Jubilee and the 50th year the same year. It can't happen because one has sowing and reaping and one has no sowing and reaping. You can't have both. Uh, so where does it say in the year of Jubilee that there, where does it say in the year of Jubilee that there's no sowing? and reaping i know there's i know the sabbath year says no sowing and reaping but does it so say does the fifth year. can you uh so does the fifth can you year. quote the verse uh leviticus 25 10 or somewhere around there maybe a little um, bit fur further on let's see here so leviticus 25 uh year of jubilee um 11 or 12, but somewhere is in that range. Okay, so I see, yes. So, the 50th year, uh, verse 11, the 50th year shall be a jubilee to you. In it you shall neither sow nor reap what grows of its own accord, nor gather of your untended vine. Um, so, um, what's your? let me ask you quickly, what's your take on uh, the Sabbath day? Do you believe in the lunar Sabbath, or do you believe in a in a unbroken cycle of seven uh, for your Sabbath reckoning? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, so when do you keep Sabbath? Do you keep Sabbath every seventh day, or does it change sometimes for you? No, it's every seventh day. Okay, so um, there's also... Um, so the question is, what calendar you're using? You're using the Enochian, or are you using the lunar, solar, or are you using some other type of calendar? Yeah, so I use the Enochian, but the, so since you do the Sabbath every seventh day, there are other days where you're told not to do work. So it says... Correct. The Holy Convocations. Yep. So six days you will work. The seventh um, is the Sabbath you shall not work. But in some weeks of the year, those holy uh, annual festivals occur on work days. So um, Passover uh, is on a work day. Then, then um, it overrides the work day. Okay, so it overrides the work day. So why w couldn't, not, not definitely, but why couldn't the same apply to the year of Jubilee? The year of Jubilee would override- Because of no sowing and no reaping. That is, that is the it. Right, but so you, you year, said, you said the no work overrides work on a norm on a normal work day. If it happens to be an annual holy day, the the permission to do your work is overrided by the command "Don't do work on this special day that comes once a year." So they're high Sabbaths. Passover and unleavened bread are high Sabbaths. Passover is high Sabbath from Exodus twelve. Unleavened bread is a high Sabbath from Leviticus 23. All right? Whatever day it falls on, it's no work. 
Correct. Even if it falls on a, what would otherwise be a work day. Uh, be a, a, a Sunday through a Friday or the so, first day through the sixth day. So if you take that same language, but instead of work, you say sowing and reaping, because sowing and reaping is work. Uh, so if you say that the year of Jubilee occurs during, during a year that is normally for sowing and reaping, but because the year of Jubilee would be like a, it would basically be comparable to a annual holy day where there's no work in the whole year. But the question is, how long does Jubilee last? I wonder if you know how long that lasts. So you mentioned Pentecost. The, right. The, it's the, the same numbering system. Yes. But did you know in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the temple, the, the, the version of the law of Moses in the, temp, in, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, excuse me. Um, so there's copies of the law of Moses in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they have some differences. And in the Law of Moses in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's extra commandments. And in those extra commandments, it gives three uh, cycles of Pentecost. It gives, it gives the basically three Feast of Weeks every year, where the first one is the Festival of the First Fruits of Wheat. The second one is the Festival of the First Fruits of Wine. And the third one is the festival of the first fruits of oil. And in it, it tells you that it's seven weeks of Sabbaths. The 50th day is the first feast of weeks, it is the first fruits of wheat. Then it says, now this is the law of Moses in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Then it says that Another seven Sabbaths, the 50th day, is the Feast of Wine. And then it says another seven Sabbaths after that, the 50th day, is the um, Feast of the First Fruits of Oil. So according to this, now this is an alternate version of the Torah. So you could say this is a false version of the Torah, but it is a version of Deuteronomy. It is claiming to be Deuteronomy, and it has the same passages of Deuteronomy, but in variance, and it has some extra passages. So this other version of the Law of Moses is telling us that there's 49 days, and the 50th is Feast of Weeks, and then another 49 days starting from that same day that you have the first fruits of, uh, of Feast of Weeks. So it actually ends up in the, this law of Moses, it has 49, followed by 49, followed by 49, and the 50th day is the start of the next 49 cycle. Um, that's what this version of the law claims. Whether it's true or not, you have to decide based on studying the alternate version of the law. Um, so in the same way, Jubilees, there's evidence that what Jubilee says in other parts agrees with these, this alternate version of the law. There's some, okay, there's some... I agree with you. I agree with you on that, on that point of view, if that's in there. There's also, in the Talmud, it talks about two numbering systems for the Jubilees. The Sadducees believed in the 50-year counting, which I believe in, and the Pharisees believed in the, 50, the 49 year. So there was competition against this and so forth and so on. This is why I think the Book of Jubilees is a falsehood that has been perpetrated on us for generations. And so, that is my main uh, argument. I'm going to jump in here. We've been going on with this Jubilees for uh, nearly 40 minutes now. Let's get on to something else. All right. I'll drop off and let y'all go on. But, but let me, I'm, let's, I'm let's, going to accept the argument that the Book of Jubilees is a falsehood perpetrated on the, on the whole Jewish, because the Pharisees were not taken false. over during the Mac falsehood. It's uh, not, not, it's I will say the final is the numbering system. It's uh, not, it's I think you're outnumbered here, Mark. Let me just say one final thing, and we won't we won't we won't continue with this. I'll let I'll let y'all go, and y'all think what y'all want. But I think the Book of Jubilees is falsehood on the numbering system, and it's perpetrated a falsehood that's been copied down through the years. And I can show you. 
It's All right, true. It's Mark. false. Mark, yes, Mark, Mark, uh, you're free to go, but can you l listen to this one thing I say? Can I say something? Can I say something on it? Um, let me say first. Okay. Jackson wants us to move on, but let me say this. My answer to what you said could easily be that the scribes changed the Book of Jubilees from 50 years. The original version of Jubilees said 50 years, and they changed it to say 49. And so Jubilees is, is corrupted, and the original version said 50 and not 49. That could easily um, uh, reconcile with your view. So uh, what did you want to say, Walter? Yeah, and then... um, so Mark, there's even discrepancies among the, the Old Testament books. And you can't say that, that this book or that book in the Old Testament is false. They're part of the canon of the Old Testament. Well, That's so he, he bought the Septuagint. That's the recently. same thing. He's there, gonna there, study. He's gonna study the Septuagint, compare there, differences, well, and then and, and the Bible and the Bible is not one book. It's a compilation yeah. of different and a lot of books. So there's always gonna be a discrepancy, and discrepancy in Judaism is is normal. Well, uh, I I would like Mark to look, study the Septuagint, compare it, and then come back to us and see what you have to say. If you've if you've learned anything or. I'd be interested to see your take on it. But like Jackson said, we should move on to another topic. I'm sorry for uh -huh. uh, it being so much focused on Jubilees. So uh, let me say that this, every time Mark comes on, it's the same old thing. <laughs> it's the same old thing. You know, Jubilees is false and it's just what I believe that is true. We're not dealing here with beliefs. We're not dealing here with subjective stuff. We're trying to get to the bottom objectively of some of these issues and questions. So I, uh, I came pretty close to booting him several times on that account. Luke, uh, do you have a question that's related to this or unrelated? Unrelated. Do you want to ask the unrelated question? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, concerning the uh, theology of the Essenes on salvation and grace, how does it differ from the early uh, church um, concept of salvation and grace? Uh, what's the difference between that of the Essenes and the early church? Can I say a word on that? Yes, I was just about to say, I've been talking so long, let Jackson go. All right. <laughs> uh, the doctrine of Acts to the Dead Sea Scrolls is very close. You only get this salvation by grace alone in Paul. You don't get it anyplace else. You get instead uh, works righteousness plus the favor of Elohim for salvation. That's exactly what the Dead Sea Scrolls account is. That's exactly what the Acts account is. But Paul brings something new in, and the question is why? That's what I'm going to speak on in the morning at the service if you want to come. For instance, where does Paul get some of his ideas that are aberrant from uh, the Nazarenes or from primitive Jewish Christians? And there is a place, there is a reason that he compromises, especially on that issue and a few more. But it's, it's the source of it is never studied and is not even well known. Why did Paul give up uh, circumcision? Why did Paul talk about grace without works? Why did Paul tell women to shut up in the assembly? They're all from the same source. I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag. Come tomorrow, listen to the... Uh, Listen to the recording. But Paul is on his own uh, road. And he says that himself. He says, let those apostles mutilate themselves in regards to circumcision. I'm going to the Gentiles or to the nations instead. He's got to make some compromises to go to the nations. So what we, we find that though Acts pretty much idolizes Paul, 
Acts does not necessarily show his theology, and certainly he got the left foot of fellowship from the disciples and family of Yahshua for a particular reason also that you find in Galatians. So when it comes to oh, another thing, let me just say, you can take, you can take uh, Galatians, I believe it's 2 and 3, and match them up with James 2, and you can see a discourse there that they are talking to each other about this very theme. Match them up. Can I say? Yeah. I'm sorry about that, brother. Uh, I think I'm in any uh, would, the, um, would this agree with the theology of the Essenes concerning salvation, where Paul says in Romans chapter 2, uh, I believe verse 13, for it's not the hearers of the Torah who are just uh, in the sight of God, but the doers of the Torah who will be justified in his sight. Um, is, it, uh, is it the belief that those who do the uh, righteous works will be justified in the eyes of our Creator? I think that it's absolutely necessary. There's no place in the, in the Torah or the prophets where that isn't the case. But you see, Paul's theology drifts. If you believe that Paul wrote 13 books, what you're going to find is as time goes on, Paul gets more liberal and more liberal and more liberal. And there's one big reason. Because when he crosses into Europe, there's something there that he has to abide by or he will be executed. And so will everybody that's with him. And I'll just tell you what that is now. Okay, I'll let the cat out of the bag. <laughs> it's the Lex Julia and the Lex Cornelia, two Roman laws, big laws, that uh, one of which um, prohibits the mutilation of, I was going to say the mutilation of the Gentiles, but I should say the mutilation of the genitals. And the only ones that had a dispensation out of that were Jews. When Paul goes into Europe, he is no longer a Jew. He's taken up his Roman citizenship, and he has to follow the laws. And the other one has to do with women speaking in the assembly. That was a grave illegal practice in the Roman Empire. So I'm going to go along a little more with that later. But when, when uh, Paul castigates the Jews, goes up into Macedonia and to Rome, he is taking a bridge that burns behind him. He's no longer considered a Jew. He's got to live by Roman laws or be executed. Thank you. Thank you. So... Um... My perspective on Paul is a little different than Jackson's, um, but you know, tomorrow Jackson's going to share his view on some more stuff on Paul. Um, but your question specifically was about about the early church, and Paul is not necessarily. I mean, Paul was a part of the early church, but when you say early church, I'm thinking the first couple, few centuries, uh, to the third century, fourth century. Just the first century, because that when Paul goes off on on his tangent. Paul well, is necessary. I don't want you to get me wrong. I'm not a Paul hater. But Paul has had to compromise the Torah to go into especially Italy. Luke, your question on early church. Were you having in mind the first century or were you having the first few centuries in mind? Excuse me. Um, the first century of the early church within Jerusalem. Okay. Um, Paul is dead after in the second and third century. Um, so the my take on it is I believe in, in what James says and I believe in what Paul says and I think they both work together in kind of a similar way you have um, you have predestination and you have free will. How do they work together? I think they both work together um, in a confusing way but in a way that makes sense. <laughs> um, for Paul specifically, keep in mind, when Paul wrote his letters, he was writing letters from a perspective of trying to advise churches. 
he was not writing letters to try to make uh, dissertations um, and essays and trying to to write the perfect book for the whole world to read a scripture divinely inspired and nothing's wrong with it. When, when you have that context in mind, you some of what he says can be his own personal opinion. And my view is that Paul basically was was mincing words, so to speak. Um, you know how people like take technicalities with words and they say, oh, well, when I say that, I really mean this type of thing. Um, I think Paul did that. I do that often in my life where I play around with words and um, so in specific uh, to whether you're justified by faith or works, I think for Paul, when he said justified by works, to him that meant you're justified by works alone. So for Paul, no, you're not justified by works because Paul's mind, he's thinking works is works by itself. You're justified by faith. Now, what is faith? Well, it depends who you ask. If you ask a modern Christian, what is faith? They're going to tell you that faith is, oh, just believe and, you know, you don't have to do anything. But, you know, if you ask a, um, if you have, if you ask a husband and wife, what does it mean to be faithful to each other? They will tell you being faithful means not cheating on each other, loving each other. And what does that mean? That means works. Um, so fidelity Infidelity means being unfaithful to your spouse. And what is infidelity in the context of a marriage? You are cheating, sleeping with someone else, um, which is works. You are, you are, you by your works, you are not having faith. So with this understanding of faith, including works, when Paul says we are saved by faith and not works, in my view, he understood faith as including works and then people later on after he wrote his letters people were reading what he said and said oh you see paul says we're saved by faith we don't have to do works so people were misinterpreting what paul said in my view they were taking what he said when he met when he said faith he meant faith that includes works and people were reading it as faith without works so james come in comes in and says the way you're interpreting paul is ridiculous um Faith without works is dead, and, you know, he writes his letter. So I believe James wrote his letter not to rebuke Paul, but to rebuke inter the interpretation of Paul that people had. Uh, you know, also, just, you've got to throw like Martin Luther, Luther into the mix there. Oh, well, he's but, centuries yeah. down the road. Yeah, right. As I believe Martin Luther is a, a heretic out of this <laughs> world. <laughs> Jackson, what were you going to say about Martin Luther? Oh, Martin Luther uh, just took that ball and ran with it, even against the rest of the reformers. And he, Lutherans celebrate this today on Reformation Sunday, that Luther said, no works is necessary of any kind. It's all justification by faith. Now, that is the hallmark of the Lutheran church. There, there are no works that can be done. You don't have you can't win awards. You can't. Uh, um, you can't save up righteousness. Even trying to do that is a sin. Now, I have been told the first preaching class that I had to go to was done by a Lutheran who was a Universalist, and he made this very clear that no works in the world could help you to as he would say, get into heaven. It's entirely the grace of Elohim. And his life showed it. I mean, he didn't do any good works. He was pretty much a profligate. Uh, he was pretty much a womanizer because those things didn't need to be done. Kind of like the Gnostics of the first and second century. Mm -hmm. um, so, sorry guys about a little bit heated uh, this time. You, you couldn't know, help it. I I did try or, to keep things calm, and um, mm -hmm. so we you want us to do this next week as well, Jackson? Yeah, so time's up now. Let's let's try it next week, and let's we'll stay. Uh, 
I don't know if I'll if I'll tolerate that. I'm I'm the moderator here, and like I told you, not to say anything out of school, but every time Mark comes on, it's the same thing. If you if you don't believe like me, you're wrong, and I don't need to have any background for what I'm saying because I know what's right, and that's it. So in a way, we didn't waste that time. We got a, a, a good explanation from you, but... We don't want this to happen every week. Yeah, from him, we really got no explanation other than it's in the Bible. I would have liked to bring up, do you realize who canonized those particular books and why certain ones might have fallen out? But... Um, I thought, well, I'm just going to exacerbate the situation. There's so much knowledge that, like, so many things are behind what I believe that it's hard for someone else who hasn't even taken the first step to see how I'm getting there. So, Amen. And I want to especially thank Walter for chiming in tonight. What you had to say was very apropos, and I'm glad to meet you. And to see the rest of you, and we've even got David Meek on tonight, who's a famous wow. producer of documentary films. There he is. Nice to see you. So we're going to get back again together next Friday at the same time. And if you can, come to the service tomorrow. I think you'll enjoy it. Thank you. Have a good night, guys. Shalom. Thanks a lot. Shalom. Bye.